الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون المعون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we recognize this momentous night the night of tragedy upon which our blessed Imam has been taken from this world and the world is bereft, though the Imam Zain al Abidin has replaced him, but bereft of this great personality, Hussein ibn Ali, who is the Sayyidi, one of the leaders of the youth of paradise. And as a father, as a husband, as an uncle, and as a man, and as a leader, and as an Imam, you find that his children were left and his, and his family were left to wander within the plains of Karbala. History says that Imam Muhammad Bakr salam, was also present in Karbala. He was quite young, the son of Imam Zain al-Abidin. And they all witnessed this tragic event. And we need to analyze it because analysis is important for us to understand for when we shed tears, and lament and complain about the injustices of the world and we take them as a lesson by which to straighten ourselves in the world today for the machinery of the Bani Umayyah that worked in 61 years after Hijrah is no different than the machinery today in the sense of treachery, lying, usurpation, murder, death, in fact, on a larger scale than ever before in history. As I mentioned before, more people are being killed now than ever in the history of the human race. World War II, they say statistically 60 million people were killed. That is more than all the battles put together preceding to that. So it shows the gravity of how we humans today can destroy humanity with the kind of technologies that we have. At the end of the day, whether it's the large size of destruction or a small size of destruction, it's the quality of destruction that is really going to hold us liable, just as is the quality of construction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us for, not in the quantity of construction. The religion of Allah is based on quality more than quantity. Please remember that. That is why Karbala, Imam's army, was less than 150 110, 115, all together 72 real warriors. The quality was unprecedented. The enemy side had over 30,000. So we know in this world today, good people are few. 
The majority is what we call silent majority, is generally ignorant. Allah said, لكن أكثر الناس لا يعقلون لا يعلمون لكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون Most of mankind doesn't know. The reason most of mankind doesn't know is because when there is bad leadership, the net result is ignorance. When there is good leadership, the net result is growth. It's just the law of life. So when we have good leaders, they will ensure that its constituent societies grow up to be nurtured, to understand the depth and the reality of why they exist. And for that constituent population to rise to higher stages of existence. But you will notice tyrants do quite the opposite. They love to promote ignorance. They love to punish people. And they love to rule people by fear. You will find that agents of God rule with love, compassion, and hope. Tyrants lead by fear and hopelessness and oppression. And the reason is because the more myopic we are, meaning the more ignorant we are, the more closed-minded, more tunnel vision we are, you find that the more harsh a person becomes. If you look at the right-wing Christian group, you look at ISIS from the Muslim group, you'll find they're very tunnel-visioned and they are very myopic, and anyone not within their vision is damned in doom and should be destroyed. That is the way of Iblis. The way of Allah is breadth of knowledge, broadness, inclusivity, and to take humanity towards higher stations, and it's with love and compassion. Those are the two different perspectives and approaches. Karbala was on one side, Imam Hussein was broad, inclusive, very forgiving, very loving, and very sharing and caring. Whereas on the other side, Yazid's army was very myopic, very crude, very rough, very evil to the core, as we mentioned yesterday, that they didn't even have compassion for a six-month-old infant. To show you how wretched and treacherous people can be. I remember watching when the war in Syria started and how the people were being mutilated and killed. In Iraq, the same problem. You look at what's happening in Yemen. You see in all these countries, when these wars start, you see some groups are emulating exactly what Yazid and his army were doing. No different. 14 centuries later, you would think that we are now more educated, more learned, that our breadth of knowledge is wider, that we would be abstaining from such madness. We find not only in Islam, you find the right-wing Christian movement, which has very, very myopic ideology of what we call cleansing the system, xenophobic, Islamophobic mentality, it's on the rise. In fact, pundits are saying democracies are going to fall, okay? Pundits are stating that the democracies of the world are going to fall. There were over 80 democracies created after World War II, and most of them are collapsing today, leaning towards right-wing extremism in the idea that fascism, what we call uh, white supremacy ideas, etc., etc., are becoming the standard in the ways of governments today. And this is no different than what Yazid was promoting. In essence, no different. And today you find economists who are, you find 99% of the world's population doesn't have what 1% of the population owns, 95% of the world's resources. So 1% of the population owns 95% of the world's resources. Do the math and you will see where the world is going. Why is that? Because ignorance is good for business. Poverty brings great profits. The poorer the society, the cheaper the labor. The cheaper the labor, the more returns you get, the more profits you get. So these oligarchs are now amassing billions and billions. People who are millionaires now are billionaires. Churches that were worth $200 million, like Jerry Falwell's church, right? was in 2004, was ranked at 250 million. Now it's over $3 billion worth because that growth in those institutions, if you look at it, those are the ideological centers promoting this, these ideologies. And then the economy is being fed by an elite few like the Koch brothers who are right-wing extremists who are extremely wealthy financing 
all these problems in the world today. Wars where countries want to make peace, they interfere and make sure treaties are broken. When treaties are being signed, they interfere to make sure treaties are broken so that wars can take place. It is no different that when we look at why Imam Hussain went to Karbala, it is precisely to show us that this will repeat itself. History is cyclical and it will repeat itself. And you and I are going to be subject to the tyrannies of the past. It hasn't passed us, trust me. History is cyclical and we have to learn from history so that we become better. In tonight's com commemoration, I send as we say, condolences to the world, and we say, Azdam Allah ujurana wa ujurakum, means may God reward us for this uh, sadness that we commemorate, for this great tragedy that Fatima the Zahra sallallahu has said, that there will come a time when the world will remember my son Hussein, for he has been put alone with his small entourage in Karbala, but the people who will uphold his name after him will rise in such numbers that they will become that source of the revolution that Allah says, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْئِفُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ It is our desire to make you oppressed the inheritors and the leaders of the world. This desire, by the way, will come true. The arada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteed as Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْسَ أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ Here, يُرِيد, by the way, here is not future. It's constant desire of God. Constant, not future. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْسَ أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ Meaning Allah's desire is to purify the Ahlul Bayt with the perfect purification. وَيُتَّحِّرَكُمْ تَطْحِيرًا Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Without complicating this conversation tonight, when we go to Karbala and we remember, inshallah, how Musa is going to recite the, the sad eulogy as we do in English, he will also do it. It's good to cry. It's good to remember. It's good to show grief. But grief not with crocodile tears. When you and I cry and we know that our Imam is being abused, we know that his family is being abused, we know Imam Zain al Abidin is being dragged city to city barefoot, that his feet are burning and bleeding, you and I should cry for ourselves. That, Ya Allah, these agents gave everything for me to be good. Am I really good? I think that's very critical. Many a times we segment ourselves from Ahlul Bayt thinking there are these glorified figures that you and I need to cry and praise like a mantelpiece on our fireplaces and then we need to just simply revere them and have nothing to do with us. It's an irony, for example, when you mention, you know, would the, like men, when I mentioned yesterday somebody doing something wrong and you say to them, well, would the Prophet do this? What's the classic answer? No. But that's the Prophet, you see? He's infallible, he's great, he's chosen. I am not. This is exactly what shaitan wants you and I to say. This way, don't apply their uh, role modelship to us. They are too above us. They are so far from us. They are so much in this, you know, um, sanctified position that don't even pretend to follow their footsteps. This is how shaitan wants us today. So the prophet, he's such a great man. Don't even think about it. Fatima the Zahra, she's so pure. Oh my God, don't even think about hijab. It, this is how we think. I remember one time a lady said to me, it's interesting, same, same behavior. Same. A Catholic lady was saying to me, why do you women wear this? I went once to a, I give an example, went to a Jewish temple and I spoke there and a Jewish man, an old man said, what is this your women are wearing? I mean, he looks at me and says, what is this? Anger, because he's been misinformed. So I looked at him, I said, have you ever watched the movie Moses? He's from, he's from the Jewish community, obviously, he said, yeah. I said, did you ask that question when the mother of Moses and the women of Moses were wearing that? Did you ask that question then? He leaned back and said, oh yeah, you're right. I never thought about that. Hmm. I said, the difference is, 
You gave it up, we didn't. It's, you don't have to go out on a limb to argue. So when there was a Catholic lady asking me, she actually made a bit of a comment, and then we got into this conversation about the hijab. She said, what is this your women are wearing? I said, you know, you have the statue of the Virgin Mary in your house, don't you? She said, yes. I said, do you ask that question? I said, you know, if you think modernity means less clothes, then let's have a modern Virgin Mary. She says, no, no, no. She's sanctified. She's pure. She's, she's holy. I said, you see the way she dresses? She said, yeah. I said, why does she dress that way? Oh, she's, they call her the mother of God. Because what they mean is she's the mother of Isa. Isa is God, so they say she's the mother of God. I said, okay, you've given her that appellation. So she's a great woman. She said, very great. Catholics revere Maryam, mashallah, like we do. We're very close to Catholics in this matter. We're very close to them. We revere Maryam too. Inna Allah has tafaki wa taharaki. Allah has chosen Maryam among all women of her time. But she said to me, but that's the Virgin Mary. She, she's too up there. I said, well, I think you should dress like her. No. I said, my God, we do the same thing. When we talk about Ahl al-Bayt and the prophets, oh, they're too great. We can't follow them. They're too perfect. So if they are so perfect, then who do we have left to follow? Imperfect people? You and I should follow imperfect people. She said, my role model is an imperfect person. People say, are you feeling okay? Your moral role model should be none other than one who is perfect in your eyes. So you, you and I notice that when we encourage each other to say, follow Ahl al-Bayt, don't ever, none of us should ever dare say, Oh, they are so far ahead. The Prophet said, me and my Ahl al-Bayt are like the Safina to Nu. We are like the Ark of Nu. Those who got on it got saved. Those who didn't get on it drowned. He said, follow us behind us. Don't stay too far away from us. You will get lost. But don't try to go ahead of us. You will also get lost. So stay right behind us. These conversations tonight and all these nights is for you and I to encourage each other to take one step closer to Ahl al-Bayt. Not as lip service, not just giving tears, but when we do cry, we say, shame on me for not being as good as I should be, given the fact that this great Imam gave his whole self and his family to save me. I think that's where the practical application really lies. Often I cry, and while I cry for the blessed Imam, what really hurts me the most is how careless I am in my way towards Allah when I should be much better than where I am. I cry for that, I said, shame on me. How great this, this Imam was, how much sacrifice these prophets gave to save us, we owe it to them. And you know, it's amazing. If you and I truly understand this, I'll give you a simple example. Adam Walsh was a young boy who was killed by a pedophile, you know, grabbed in a supermarket in America, and he was killed, beheaded, and his body was thrown in the, in the water. Really sad, very, very tragic story. The father was just, he couldn't bear it. The pain was horrendous. This is a great, great analogy that you and I should touch on. And the father was in, ex in, in excruciating pain. You know, when you're a father, your son is killed. This beautiful, innocent child taken away. You can't even imagine the pain the child must have gone through, that terror when this wicked man did what he did to this young boy, right? What do you do? You beat yourself till you die? Do you cry lugubriously? such that you can do nothing and you become a zombie and now you stay home and you become, you know, depressed and then you take poison and you take drugs and you die? Well, that is one option, but that's a foolish option. The real option is to say, the enemy took my beloved. I will not let the enemy win. Same like Karbala. I will not let. So his father, John Walsh, said, I am going to come on television and I am going to catch the criminals. America's Most Wanted was a show that he ran very successfully and thousands of criminals were arrested because of his work where he engaged societies to become the eyes and witnesses against oppression by which to incarcerate, if not put them away permanently for criminals. 
So notice, a father refuses to let the spirit of his son die by standing on the altar of justice and promoting justice and equity and preventing more children from getting killed. This is just one father to a son. Combine thousands, infinitely more in thought is Imam Hussein in Karbala. That you and I should say, this sacrifice cannot be subdued. I am a proponent of this sacrifice, and every one of us in this room, breathing, eating, talking, becomes a flag bearer to say, because of that, we will make sure that that message never dies. But how? How? You and I should be impeccable in character. Indeed, I was sent to perfect your moral trait. You and I should practice good akhlaq. We should avoid the haram. We should avoid, as I say, fault finding, gossiping. When we look down on people, we talk bad about people, it's because we have a low sense of self-worthiness. Hence, we're quick in finding faults in others. If you and I were truly grounded with Allah, and we truly understood the gift God has given us, and truly understand that we have a mission in life to become better, and truly understand that time is against us, this surah is profound. It's negation followed by an exception, and it's got four actions with was in it. Four things you and I must do for time not to destroy us. Because God says time by time mankind is at a loss. Except those. So you and I have to say time is against us. We have no time to gossip, to fault find, to create bickerings and, and drama. It's amazing how humans are busy listening to drama and manufacturing stories that are not true. Hence, we get old, Malakul Mot is getting ready to take our souls, and we haven't achieved much. When the Imam is saying, I gave this great sacrifice, should you not have kept it going? Should you not have understood my blood? Should you not have followed its footsteps? You cried every year. How much change did you make? Zainab salam profoundly states that, that when she enters Kufa, people were beating themselves. She said, now you wail, now you cry. When my brother called you, you shut the doors and you turned the blind eye. Now you wail. Hmm? What was it that prevented you from doing what you needed to do? So you let, us, let you and I not be that. Where on judgment day, we regret. You see, Yazid is mentioned in character in the Quran. Muawiyah is mentioned in character in the Quran. Even this, This is Muawiyah, Yazid. Have you not seen those who belie the religion of God? Hmm? They hold back from the orphans. Hmm? They keep the food away. They are in love with wealth. And then they do things to show off. You see? Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, look at these people, they're fake. But you find the Quran is saying something profound, and God forbid you and I there. Allah says, when hell is roaring, فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَصُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Look how elegant the Quran is in Surah Al-Mulk. He says when this raging fire is roaring and you can hear it, and these people like Yazid and Muawiyah are about to be flung in hell. The angels look at them and say, how did you get here? You must have worked hard. I'm paraphrasing. You must have worked hard. So they're asking him, Alam ya'tikum nadir. Didn't a warner come to you? How did you end up here? Hell is not easy to come to. They said, Qalu, 
they say, you know, that when he, no, he says, no, the prophet did come. He did tell us that he's bringing the message, you see. But we belied him. فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا And we said, مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ There was no revelation. In fact, Imam Zain al-Abideen is in the palace of Yazid. Yazid even states that again. Ah, oh, he claims, his grandfather claims to have received revelation. There was no revelation. See, same. Muawiyah used to say that. Abu Sufyan used to say that. Abu Sufyan used to say, this man, Muhammad, put his name even in the Adhan. And I'm going to eradicate it. And I'm going to efface it. And I'm going to make sure that I come in between it. Abu Sufyan, arch enemy. There are people sadly today who say, radiallahu anhu. You know, I say, listen, on that day, everybody will be raised with the Imam. And if you consider Muawiyah to be good and you call him radiallahu anhu, I pray Allah raises them with Muawiyah. Now you might say, oh my God, brother. Yeah, a man comes to me and says, Muawiyah was a great man. I said, you really think he's a great man? He said, yes. I said, I make dua in the masjid. Allah raises you with him on judgment day. I said, and by the way, I love Ali and Abi Talib. I love Amir al-Mu'mineen. Why don't you make dua Allah raises me with him? There's a big difference. Hmm? So this Karbala, when we listen to it tonight, you find they were so treacherous. But look what Allah is saying. When they will be flung, they will say, yes, yes, we belied. And when they came and told us, we told them there was no revelation. Then they will say the following. لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَاقِلُ If only we listened and paid attention, we would not be here going to hell. لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَاقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ We would not be entering hell. Allah says, فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ They will recognize their evils. And God is furthest away. So tonight, as we remember this, inshallah we'll do a Q&A shortly. You'll find that you and I should ask these 10 nights that have happened and it will continue. Inshallah Allah will give us many more of these nights of Ashura, give us the nights of Ramadan, will give us the opportunity to do Hajj and to maintain Salah five times a day and to be the flag bearers of modesty and to rise to the occasion to become good role models and to say my Imam is very close to me. I want to hold on to his coattails. I want to follow him. I won't even want to feel the aroma of the Imam such that I start to smell like the Imam. It's beautiful aroma. I want to be in the footsteps of Rasulullah. How? It's not easy, but I'll tell you how. Stop the bad behavior. Simple. Somebody gossips, excuse me. I don't want. And stop, let, we must all stop worshiping people. Let us stop worshiping people. Let us stop showing off. There is no need. In Allah, la yuhibbu kulla mukhtalin fakhur. God doesn't love somebody showing off. La yuhibbu kulla mukhtalin fakhur. God doesn't like it. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves humble people. Khashi'een. Innaha la kabiratun. Wasta'inu bis sabri was salat. You see? Maintain patience in prayer. It's difficult. Right? Except the khashi'een. Khashi'een are God conscious people. Let's pray tonight, every night. Ya Allah, increase. Rabbana atmim lana nurana. Wa lana. My Lord, perfect for me my light. And protect me. And forgive me. Make me a better person. But we must start to forgive. Let's not be vindictive. When people have done us wrong, if there's room to forgive, quickly forgive them. Pick up the phone. Forgive. Keep, forgive in your heart. The minute you let go of that bala, the minute you let go of that negative, you'll start to become free. When that freedom opens up in our hearts, our minds will grow and we will become bold. We will become intrepid as we say we will become strong our iman will increase and we don't need to talk bad about people i don't need to put somebody down so i look good i don't need that it's in fact haram say my lord to izzu man tasha wa tudhillu man tasha qulillahumma malik al mulk tu'ti al mulk man tasha wa tanzil al mulk mim man tasha wa tu'izzu man tasha wa tudhillu man tasha it is god who gives me my wealth it is he who gives me honor it is he who debases people my trust is with allah as imam husain alayhi salam so in history you find the nature of our imam was incredible 
Imam Zainul Abidin. He witnessed, they said yesterday, as I mentioned, after the commotion, and as the Imam's head was being cut, the soldiers were screaming. There was so much noise. Imam Zainul Abidin, in his swoon, hears this, and he opens up the tent to see his father's head on a spear. And he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajum. That image should be ensconced indelibly into our heads and into our hearts. That image of the Imam looking at his father's head. That image should be ensconced. It should be part of our spirit. Every moment, that image. My Imam did, saw that. That tyranny, I will never accept it. It's like that father who remembers his son's body being cut by an enemy. He says, I will never forget that. Because of that, I will continue to promote justice. Every single day, this is the positive energy we need to bring forth for Karbala. Very important. But you find Imam Zainal Abidin was so strong. Listen to what he said. It's amazing. When you, when you observe, by the way, history, very quick history, you find that right after the event of Karbala, you find that the soldiers started to come and telling the women, get out of the tents. The women refused because they knew these men are tyrants. They're awful. They're evil people. So they started to burn the tents. They lit the tents on fire. This happened right after Imam Hussein was Shaheed and his companions, and they started now looting. They started looting, they started grabbing anything they could get from the children, the women, because they became incensed. Human behavior becomes very animalistic when it gets incensed with power. This happened in New York City. There was an uprising in an orphanage, an African-American orphanage was so beaten up by people's rage that if you study human behavior, we were lower than animals. Allah said, Kal an'am bal hum adal. They are like cattle? No, worse. Human nature, we can be lower than animals under these conditions. And Zainab salam is holding fort now. That trial of Zainab, if you and I simply feel the energy of her trial, keep it in the heart. Every single day, follow Zainab Follow her mother, Fatima Follow her grandmother, Khadija who gave all her wealth to Islam. People think Islam was financed by men. It was financed by a woman. Khadija financed the entire momentum and movement of Islam. She financed the Holy Prophet's entire movement in the time when she was alive. To the point where she had no money. This is the grandmother of Imam Hussain these are not ordinary women. When we look for spouses, when we pray for children, when we look at our sisters within our communities, we should imagine these women and say, this is the kind of woman I want. Let's have a standard, not the one Hollywood presents us with or some glamorized you know, system. No, this is the kind of woman we want. Let the world call us backwards. We're not backwards. We're advanced. We're way too advanced. You know why? We know how to put people on the moon, but we don't know how to keep families together because our systems are so broken. But Islam teaches us within those parameters that even if families are not being kept, at least modesty and decency should be kept, for that's the bedrock of foundation. On Judgment Day, Allah will ask us, the whole human race, billions of us, were you honest? Were you trustworthy? Did you lie? Did you cheat? Were you selfish? Were you kind? Were you loving? Were you giving? Were you forgiving? These are the kind of questions all of us will be asked. You and I as Muslims will be asked even more complicated questions because we've been endowed with that knowledge and Allah will expect us to be the flag bearers of knowledge and he will ask us min rabbik min kitabik min rasulik who who is your prophet min imamik who is he and if you don't know then Allah will say how come you don't know when I gave you this and I gave you more than the rest of society so tonight when we remember Karbala you see that while Zainab is standing there in chains they say it took 24 hours as they were digging graves, burying the soldiers, because thousands of them were killed. Can you imagine? 72 warriors killed thousands, thousands. Just I told you, Habib ibn Madhair alone killed close to 60 foot, 62 to 70 people by his own hands. Imagine, compound them all, there were thousands who were killed. They were burying them while they left the family of the Prophet to remain on the plains of Karbala. Zainab is watching this, this breach of justice. And I tell you, there is so much to learn from this. But the intrepid nature to find that while our imams are being denied their justice, 
you find they were never, ever vengeful, never to the point of, of uh, losing faith, but all they did was good, good, good. I told you, after Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin gave us Saifa Sajjadiyah. In the annals of history, I still cannot understand how a human being who witnesses his father's head on a spear is able to write a compilation of du'as, Psalms of Sajjad salam, by which he teaches us how to reach proximity to God in such a caring way, in such a loving way that you were oppressed by the negligence of people yet you care so much for people this is why Imams are so special you and I must follow that that even if people condemn us, they curse us, they speak bad about us we do good to them as the Prophet said, when somebody does bad to you, punish them by being kind to them. Punish them. For when you're kind, you are, you are subduing, you are diffusing the animosity and the perpetuity of negative thoughts. Imam Zainul Abidin is standing and Hussein bin Namir is there pouring water. Imam says, I'm thirsty. Give me some water. And Hussein said, you can't. He was one of the commanders of Yazid's army. He said, no, you cannot have it. He was taunting the Imam. Imam. A humble, gentle, magnificent human being. Hisham bin Abdul Malik, as we heard when Farazdaq stood up, he was trying to touch the black stone. And Imam Zain al Abidin just walks into the Kaaba. Everybody is silent, like a buzzing sound. For this agent of God, the representative of Allah, has entered. That is, that is the charisma Imam Zain al Abidin had. You would think he would be debased. You would think he would be humiliated after Karbala. His honor increased thousands of times more because people were stunned by his patience. This is the kind of leadership we have. This is the kind of character you and I need to have. Imam Zain Labin is looking at Hasim, says, I'm thirsty, can I have some? He says, you can't, and he spills it. Imam says, no problem, we are patient. God loves the patient ones. Inna lillah wa inna ilahi rajiun. We are patient. You find soon after, story says that Ibn Ziyad wanted to pontificate, to show off. Hey, look what we just did. We just killed Hussein Ibn Ali. So he goes around telling the whole world. He sends an emissary to Medina. And the people of Medina, when they hear Imam Hussein was killed, their women, the Banu Hashim, start to lament and cry. And they come out in public. And they become the public voice of humanity and telling the world the dhulam of Yazid. Soon thereafter, people started to rise against the Bani Umayyah. It started in all directions, from Medina to Mecca to everywhere. People started rising. What? You killed the Prophet's family? How dare you did this? He thought that by showing off that, look, I'm a powerful Khalifa, look what I did, it backfired on him. That's why you notice historically, after Karbala, every Imam was poisoned. Why not killed in public? Because they learned from the Bani Umayyah that when you kill the agent of God in public, the public will destroy you. So what you do is you silently kill them. That's why after that, all our Imams were poisoned. The reason, it was a silent way of killing our Imams. But Imam Hussain alayhi salam was unique. So as they start spreading this rumor, you see, and it starts going all around, the people start to rise. Historians say, and I'm going to speak very quickly, Ibn Ziyad was building a white palace in Basra. He was the governor of Basra, and he was also the governor of Kufa. First time a governor of two, two cities. He was building, and Imam Hussein said to Ibn Ziyad, you will not sleep one night in that palace that you've built. And lo and behold, true. As he's trying to aim towards Basra, there are people are rising. He had to hide himself under the belly of the camel, and Ibn Ziyad runs away to Damascus under the belly of a camel in an entourage of camels because he couldn't find any spot. People started rising. And what happened is when Zainab salam comes to Kufa, she stands and Ibn Ziyad is now pontificating and said, I killed your refractory brother. She says, I don't see anything. Ma ra'aytu illa jameelan wa rahma. Look at the character. The combination of the events are so rich. There's no time tonight within this short period that I have just to give us the spirit of the uprising. Imam Zain al-Abidin says to Hassan bin Namir, no problem, patient, he has a long-term vision. History shows Imam when he is released, he goes to Medina, and you know Yazid leaves him alone because Yazid realizes that if he taunts Imam Zain al-Abidin, his days are numbered even faster. As you know, he was only a Khalifa for a few years, three years, and he was gone. And by the way, the will of Muawiyah to have his generation to become Khalifa faded away because Marwan ibn Hakam took over and his generation took off. So Muawiyah never got his wish. 
And the Umayyads ruled for a thousand months. One thousand months was the rule of the Umayyad Empire. And it was vicious, wicked in general, wicked. But the Imam was patient. When the Imam al Abidin was in Medina, this same Hassan bin Namir was being chased now. He, now the people are rising and they're chasing these very soldiers of Karbala. And he's wandering, thirsty and hungry. And who's now at, subhanAllah, what can I say? He's wearing a hood. Imam Zain al-Abidin is wearing a hood, covered. In the dark of the night, what is he doing? Going home to home to feed orphans, to feed the poor. Who would have that kind of energy when the world has turned its back on you and killed your whole family? Would you and I get out of the house to go feed the poor? That's what Imam Zain al-Abidin was doing. In the dark of the night, Imam Muhammad Bakr says, when I washed my father's body upon his shahada, he had a scar on his back because he carried so much weight and grain caring for the poor. So Imam is, has water and grain and Hasim shows up in the dark. He says, I'm thirsty. Imam looks at him. He doesn't recognize the Imam. The Imam recognizes him. And Imam says, sure. He starts pouring water for him, and he notices the scar the Imam had because he had chains that he was put on and it scarred his wrist. Hasin bin Namer notices that, and he looks quite carefully and he notices it's the same Imam that just a short while ago he, he spilled the water, didn't give it to him. The Imam looks at him with a smile and gives him water. This is Islam. This is Islam. I cannot put words into this event, this one event. The Imam is pouring water, giving it to him, giving him some grain. And Hasin looks at him and says, you are Ali ibn al -Hussain. Imam said, that's right. But we don't do what you did. You stopped us, you killed us, you denied us water and food. But we're not like that, we will serve you. This was the power. But I want to go one step and then I'm gonna end this because there's no time tonight. So much to say. Understand in history that the Wabin rose. People like Suleiman bin Sur the Khazai, people like Mukhtar Saqafi, people like Ibrahim ibn Malik al Ashtar, they rose from Kufa and they started attacking the Umayyad army. Back and forth, 20,000 sometimes, 30,000, 10,000 soldiers. They were known as the Tawabin, who came and Ibn Ziyad was killed, Umar ibn Sa'd was killed. They were all killed and their heads were put on the same doors that they hung the family of Ahlul Bayt. And Allah says, look at them. Yesterday they thought, today they are no different, and now they are damned and doomed to hell. But what you find is the Imam's intrepid nature, and I'm going to say this. He enters, you know Yazid was drunk. They say it took seven adhan. When they arrived at the gate of Damascus in the palace of Yazid, seven adhan was recited while the Imam He's standing with Zainab salam and the children and the women, and they're standing there seven adhan while Yazid was busy playing and drinking. And people were taunting. And by the way, this idea, if you go to the Middle East today, even Morocco, they celebrate on the day of Ashura. This fasting, people say fasting on the day of Ashura. This is a concoction. You find that the Hadith states that the Prophet sees the Jews fasting that day, and he asked them, what are you doing? They said, oh, Moses freed us. Oh, Prophet said, oh, great idea. Yeah, I'd like to do that too. Please, brothers and sisters, we're not that stupid as Muslims that we, the prophet of Islam, gets his knowledge from other people. Allah is his teacher, the angel is his teacher. This concoction of an idea that the prophet is receiving his messages from subordinate people is like putting the card in front of the horse. It never happened. This is, the idea was to promote the Umayyad way of celebration. Today, even if you go to Morocco until today, the day of Ashura, they hand out chocolates and they um, make it very embellished outside. They celebrate because the Umayyads wanted them to celebrate. But it backfired on them and the message of Imam Hussein continues to grow. So let's not fall for these kinds of stories. Imam Zain al-Abidin, when he enters, Zainab first addresses Yazid. She says, Ya Yabn Abtulaqa, O you son of a freed slave. As you know, his grandfather Abu Sufyan was a slave of the Prophet with the Prophet's freed because he defeated him in Mecca and the Prophet freed him. He said, you are the son of a freed slave. Can you compare us with you? Look at Zainab, a woman. After her brother has been killed, you would think this king, this Khalifa is sitting on the throne that he, he will behead anybody. And he did. But Zainab had no fear. She was like Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
Now Imam Zain al-Abideen notices this, and I'm going to end with this. Subhanallah. Imam Zain al-Abideen, as you know, first, while they're standing there, Yazid says to one of his cronies, go up there and speak. So the guy goes up, oh, Yazid, Ibn Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan. Oh, what a great man. His father is such a great man. Praising him, praising him, because that's how the Umayyads were. And Imam looks at him and says, this is haram. And he says to him, why do you do this to please your master and the people? You should, do, you should speak the truth to please Allah. So he asks Yazid the following. He says, Qala Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam, Ya Yazid, I'adhin li hatta as'ada hadhi al a'wad, fa atakallam bi kalimati, bi kalimati lillahi fi hinna, ridaw, wa liha ulai al julasa fi hinna, ajrun, is it ajrun? Thawab. Imam Zain al-Abidin. Look at what Imam says. Yazid, do you allow me to climb up these pieces of wood? He doesn't say pulpit, pieces of wood. Because Imam Zain al-Abidin is saying two things. So that I can speak to the people for the pleasure of Allah. He is basically saying these are pieces of wood that you guys are lying on. So it's not a pulpit. And what's being spoken is not for Allah. So I'm going to change it. For the first time in 40 years after Syria was taken over, for the first time a true Muslim entered to speak to the people. First time. Because Yazid, the brother of Muawiyah, was the first governor. After he died, after a few years, Muawiyah became the governor. He remained the governor until the end. So Syria was constantly subjected to false information of Islam. Imam Zain al-Abideen for the first time enters, gets on the pulpit and says the following. It says, amazing, when you, when you study it, you will see that, subhanAllah, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Imam says, ayyuhan nas, u'tina sitta, sitta, uh, sitta, sitta wa fudilna, wa fudilna bis sabah. Allah has honored us with six qualities and seven. And he describes these seven. For the sake of brevity and time, subhanAllah, you find that Imam Zain al-Abideen, when he describes it, he says the following. He says, all listeners, Allah has given us six things which no one else has. He has given us special wisdom, patience, dignity, power of speech, courage, and respect. And he gave a special benefit of belonging to the family of his prophet. To us belong Hamza, Jafar, Asadullah, the Lion of God. To us belong the leader of the youths of paradise, Hassan and Hussein. All people, whoever recognizes me, knew me, and whoever did not recognize me, will inform me of my, of my honorable lineage and ancestry. Imam Zain al-Abideen is now for the first time telling them, you have the wrong leader, I am the right leader. I'm the one chosen by Allah. This man is a profligate who has no authority to lead. His father, his grandfather, they were all evildoers. They cannot lead you. We are of a different quality. Yazid is so disturbed by it, he says to the Mu'addin, read Adhan. It wasn't prayer time. Read Adhan. Just to distract Imam Zain al-Abidin. The Mu'addin is reading, Allahu Akbar. Imam says, Jalla Jalalahu Rabbi. He's on the pulpit still. The man is reading Adhan. He said, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, right? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know what he say? He says, Uskut, be quiet. Oh Muadhin, be quiet. And the Muadhin is quiet. He looks at Yazid and says, Yazid, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasul. This Muhammad, is he your grandfather or is he my grandfather? Wow, this was that golden moment. Imam now has, the, has Yazid cornered. Yazid is sitting on the throne drunk, and the Imam says, is this man who just recited Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, is he your grandfather or is he my grandfather? And if you claim that he's your grandfather, you're a liar. 
and you know that he is my grandfather. So I ask you in front of all these people, why did you kill my father, his grandson? Why did you kill the one the Prophet said, Hussein no minni wa ana min al Hussein? Why did you kill us? And Yazid didn't know what to do, he put his head down. This is the end of the conversation. We will continue it some other time. May Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah, to understand that after all this tyranny, notice the Imam was strong, unafraid, penetrating, and historians say Yazid soon after released them. And you know when he released them, what did Zainab salam request in Imam Zainal Abidin? You know what he requested? The first request. He said to Yazid, Give us a place to have a majlis. This gathering. The first thing Zainab salam did, the first thing Imam Zainul Abidin did, he was still in the palace of Yazid. He said, give us a place, some place here, where we will get together and we want to lament the event of Karbala. This sunnah of Rasulullah, which the Prophet started and showed us to cry for the shuhada, is the sunnah of Rasulullah. Imam Zainul Abidin is asking Yazid, give us a place. And the people gathered, and the first majlis of Imam Hussain alayhi salam was held in the palace of Yazid. Subhanallah, you couldn't put the dagger stronger into the heart of the devil than that. That's why these lectures, these gatherings should never stop. Inshallah, it'll grow for the entire world to understand it. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. There is much for me to say, inshallah, in the Q&A. I will touch on it, but while the questions are being asked, just one point. Imam Hussein took the women because they are the media. The women became the media of Imam Hussein. It was the women who spoke. The mother of Abbas was vocal. Rabab was vocal. Layla was vocal. The women, Umm Kulthum, were vocal, vocal, vocal. They are the ones who would stand in public and they would call the people unafraid. They say, Rabab refused to go back to Medina. She remained in Karbala. She put a little tent. She would remain there. Her two, remember her two children became shuhada, Al, -Yak, Al Yasghar and Ruqayya. She remained there. She refused to go back. And every time a caravan would come, she would wave at them. She would welcome them. She would tell them the entire event of Karbala. And she became shahida there, and she's buried there. That's just one wife of Imam Hussein alayhi Please understand that if this woman who bore witness to the whole tragedy and gave her two beautiful little children, what option do you and I have in today's world if not to rise to the occasion to educate ourselves and to become the flag bearers? I don't know what else to say. Salawat. <laughs> Are we ready? Inshallah. We'll do a quick Q&A. As you know, people have been asking lots and lots of questions. Usually when we have Q&A, uh, we are always blessed with hundreds of questions, and it's a blessing. Some are repetitious questions. Uh, some are lengthy or could be taken in, in, a, in a lot of different perspectives. So for the sake of brevity, we've chosen just a few. Uh, my Hajj Ali Khalfan, uh, inshallah, will be conducting these, so please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I just want to remind us all of a very interesting tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said that the key to the closet of knowledge is asking questions. So it's very good we have this Q&A right now. And Alhamdulillah, we have received close to 100 questions, and I'm not sure if we have, we will have the time no. to go through 100, unless you all want to stay here till Fajr. No, 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 no. <laughs> and you know my problem, sometimes I give a lecture for a question. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, so this actually gives us more of a, a reason for Hajj Hasmei to come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you want me finishing all the questions? Inshallah. Uh, we'll go with the first question, very quickly. How do you respond to a child when the child asks, why did God not help Imam Hussein's family? Very good. So, why did Allah not help? Allah did. Allah helped Imam Hussein in many ways. 
He could have annihilated the enemy, but the function and the purpose of life is for you and I to rise to the occasion and to fight tyranny even at the cost of our lives. If Allah were to interfere in those matters at all times, then there'd be no value to us. As I mentioned before, when Allah created us, He gave us free will. And that free will is a gift of God. But one of the conditions of the free will is that you and I must use it to promote good and forbid evil. If Allah were to interject and He keeps doing good things for us and we don't have to do anything, then essentially He's taking our free will away from us, then there's really no value for us. While Allah does many good things for us, uncountable things, Nonetheless, we're still responsible for our destiny. Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayiru ma bianfusim. Allah doesn't change the affairs of a community until the community changes themselves first. Imam Ali alayhi salam beautifully says that yourself is your greatest enemy and yourself is your greatest friend. If you and I do not rise to the occasion to say that God has endowed me with free will and that I must rise to fight tyranny and I seek God's help in the process, that's different than saying, you know what, I'm not going to do anything, God, you do everything. So Allah did help Imam Hussein by strengthening him, by giving him valor, by making that covenant with him and giving him that choice by which he could have given bayat to Yazid. It was a free will. But Imam says, never will I ever do that. For I see its ugliness and it's impossible for me to do that which is wrong. So, but to say that Allah should have annihilated the enemy, as I mentioned, it's in the quality of that uh, struggle that you and I have that's really valuable. And please understand, no matter what happens in this world, we were not created for this world. We were created for the next world. But this world is the springboard for the next world. And if we don't struggle on this earth, then there is no real value in the next world. Because otherwise, Allah should have put us in paradise without putting us on this earth for any trials. Because Allah is merciful. We are destined for paradise. Then why put us here? Precisely so that we can participate in the elevation of ourselves. That's why we say, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. This ayah is mentioned where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who will enter paradise, as they're entering paradise, they will say the following. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna lina hatadiya lawla hadana Allah. If you didn't help us, if you didn't guide us, we wouldn't be here. So Allah say, we are saying to Allah, thank you for helping us reach paradise, but the struggle here is imminent. Thank you. Here's another question. Uh, there are two questions I'm going to ask together because it has the same subject. There is a Sunni sister who wants to become a Shia, but she's worried that her parents would curse her. Another question along the same lines. I love the Ahl al-Bayt and I try to follow them, but I'm confused between Sunni and Shia. Half my family is Sunni and the rest are Shia. I feel that I lack my ident ident identity as a Shia in the family. It becomes hard for me to practice my faith. This is a very difficult battle I'm going through. Right. Can you give me some guidance? Good question. Look, the goal in life is for you and I to struggle. Whether we achieve the results of the struggle is a secondary matter. Struggle is where the trial is, not the achievement of the struggle. Please understand that. So when Allah says, Ya ayyul insan, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi, struggle, O mankind, struggle upon struggle till you meet your Lord, the real trial is in the struggle, not in the achievement of the struggle. The achievement of the struggle comes sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you die before you, you finish it. The important point to remember is the struggle. So if you have a family, if we have a family that's very close-minded, very one-directional, and considers any other school of thought to be forbidden, right? It is their right to feel that way. That's why they're there. When Christians come to me and say, I'm right, you're wrong. I said, bravo, I like that. Oh, what do you mean I like that? I'm telling you, you're wrong. So, well, I'm saying I'm right and you're wrong. So not, we're, we're on the same side, you get it? But the fact that you say I'm right and therefore I'm wrong is good. It shows that you believe in what you believe in. And you should be there. I don't like to talk to somebody who's flimsy, who says, well, I don't know where I am. Well, hold on to position and let's hold on to it and let's talk about it. So when someone says my school of thought is superior to the other school of thought, it should be, it's logical. What do they say? My school of thought is horrible, that's why I'm here. Nobody does that. Everybody holds on to what they believe to be right. So it's okay. But to curse sometimes is an extreme form. 
So the way we do it is we win their hearts by priming them and broadening their understanding with, with information that will inshallah expand their horizons and to diffuse this myopic animosity that many, many times we have. People who have such attitudes do it to protect their own ignorance. This is why we are that way. We're very quick in condemning the other side because we are shallow. We are afraid of being exposed. So the quickest way is to accuse everybody and condemn them so that nobody can come towards me. Wisdom says the opposite. You allow the dialogue. You allow that variation of conversation. But you are searching for the truth. You slice through it and you say to the Christian, A, B, C, D, and E. A and E are right, B, C, and you know, whatever are wrong. I disagree with you. I'm going to pick these and I'm going to tell you these are right. Have a dialogue. Don't take a broad brush and say, you're a Christian, you're bad, you're going to hell. This is not Islam. The same between the madhahib when we talk. If you look at the five schools of thought, we're 95% identical, 98% in fact, if, depending on how you look at it. We're very similar in deen, in religion. I always say there are no two people on earth who agree on everything. Even identical twins don't agree on anything. There are no two human beings. A child born of a mother doesn't agree of everything the mother says, though the flesh of the child is from the mother. But that doesn't mean we condemn each other because we have a difference of opinion. We have to agree to disagree agreeably, and we must foster diversity, but not at the cost of condemnation and damnation. Condemnation and damnation ceases to bring growth in the conversation. And now we create walls between each other. And when we create walls, we're promoting jahiliyyah. So when we have dialogues between different schools of thought, it is not to condemn the other side, it is to encourage tawassal bil haq wa tawassal bil sab. How do we all get closer to Allah and Rasulullah? How do we get closer to the Quran? This is the conversation. So it's not about Sunni and Shia. And I'm going to tell you, very fundamental principle. Surah Nisa, verse 59, if you have ever read it, I had a group of people from different schools of thought come and say, prove to me that the authority of imamat is in the Quran. I said, first and foremost, have you understood verse 59? I said, if you understand the Arabic, you will know where I'm going with this. It's an interesting story. I had a brother with, this is a true story. I was lecturing in Washington, DC. I'm giving time and spaces for you to know how truthful it is. A man came all the way from Tennessee, from the other school of thought from the school of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He said, I like what you say, I listen to your lectures, but I've come here to convince you that you're wrong. I said, I'm honored. You drove 10, 12 hours to come and talk to me. He said, yes, I want to convince you you're wrong. So, but I'm warning you, I'm an expert in Arabic. I have read the Kutub Arba, and I'm an expert in Sahih Sitta. He said, mashallah, uh, I'm letting you know I'm not. So have a seat. <laughs> So we sit down, he says, brother, you go and ask first. I said, no, you, want, you go ahead. He said, no, you ask first. So you should ready? He said, yeah. I said, Surah Al-Nisa, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, atiullah wa atiur rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Who to you are ulil amri minkum? Allah is my witness. This is open space. For good 20 seconds, 30 seconds, he's staring at me. I said, did I ask the question wrong? You want me to repeat it? He says, no, no, I know your question, but I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> Subhanallah, it was amazing. I said, you're the expert. You can't even answer my first verse. He says, I know where you're going to go with this, because no matter what I say, you're going to trap me. I said, no, I'm not going to trap you. You are trapped. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. If I trap you, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But look, you can't even utter the words. You've trapped yourself. So we get into this, and he doesn't, he, we, we, he circumvents, he says, it's okay, brother, you wear brothers, let's, let's love each other, inshallah, we'll, we'll continue this conversation another time. I said, you drove 10 hours all the way from Tennessee? You could, I mean, I just asked you the first verse. I mean, I'm ready to go, I've got like dozens ready, lined up, which one do you want? Because I can go from Surah Al-Fatiha all the way to Surah Al-Insan, and I'll keep quoting verse after verse for you, and I think we can talk about this. Quran says, wa minkum. The wa here is very clear. So for you and I, please, common sense, think about this. Religion comes from Allah and the Prophet. Please know this. Religion comes from Allah and the Prophet. And what I'm going to say is not bashing the other schools of thought. I'm talking rational conversation here. 
It's not about one school superior. We're all struggling to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's put it that way. But we all agree, all five schools of thought insist that there should be a leader after the Prophet. That's why we argue. One says it's this one, one says it's that one. We argue. Here's the catch 22. One says, as important as it is, Allah did not appoint it, nor did the Prophet. And he left it to the people. And there was no criteria. Like, how do you appoint? We have no idea. Well, who, who's the criteria? We don't know. The other school of thought says, only Allah and the Prophet can appoint. We don't have the wisdom and understanding to appoint. Only Allah and the Prophet can appoint. And the criteria is very clear. It's within the shajaratin mubarakatin zaytunatin la sharkhiyatin wa la gharbiya. It's not somebody picking the caliphate who takes over, you take over, you take. No, it's specific within the family. You notice, look at Adam, branch Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq. From Ishaq comes the Bani Israeli prophets, all the way to Isa alayhi salam. From Ismail comes all the way Imam Sahib zaman They are cousins of each other from one blessed tree. Not from anywhere else, one family. And if you think it's royalty, one son inheriting the other. Okay, Allah says, wa waritha Sulaiman Dawood. Quran says that. Sulaiman inherited Dawood. They are both prophets. Is this royalty? Hmm? How about Zakaria? Zakaria is praying, he has no son. He says, Yarithuni wa yarithu min ali Yaqub. Give me an inheritor. You are a prophet. And Allah says, Ya Zakaria, inna nubashiruka bi ghulami nismu yahya lam naj'allahu min qablu samiyya. Hmm? Allah says, I give you good news, you will have a son. And I will give him wisdom when he's a baby. Yeah? And he is of a great, great lineage, chosen. He inherits Zakaria. And, and we know Yahya was a prophet of God. So how did a prophet succeed a prophet? How did Yusuf succeed Yaqub? You find prophet succeeding prophet, succeeding prophet. So when, a pro when the Imams are succeeding each other, this is not royalty. This is appointment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within this blessed tree. Why the blessed tree? One wisdom is Allah is making it easy for you and I to know who they are. For if everybody came from distant places and popped up from nowhere claiming to be a prophet, it would be very hard to validate. But when there's a lineage, when there's a family, it's easy, you know it's coming. That's why you notice when Maryam, think, look at the Quran, how elegant it is. When Maryam brings Isa alayhi salam, what was the accusation of Maryam, against Maryam? Ya ukhta haruna ma kana abu kimra asawin wa ma kanat ummu kibagiyya. Listen to the verse. Maryam brings the baby. They know Maryam is pure. She's under the tutelage of Zakaria in the house of Suleiman, in the temple of Suleiman. She's a pure, pure lady. Everybody knew who she is. Everybody knew she was a great woman. When she brings the baby, the first accusation was, your father and your mother were pure. What did you do? Notice lineage, Ahl al-Bayt. Very important. You want to know how the prophet prayed? Who would you go ask? If I want to know how the, how the Prophet prayed, I'll go to China and ask Confucius? No. I'm going to go to Medina, where the Prophet lived, and the closer I get to the Prophet, the more I know about him. Who more can you know than the family? That's why Ahlul Bayt is so important. So it's not something we concocted, it's within the deen. And here it's not putting one against the other. It's common sense. Religion is only from Allah and the Prophet. If they don't appoint, you and I cannot appoint. Simple. Please understand that. I can go on and on discussing this, but I think you're getting the point. Thank you. I think the answer to these two questions became semi lecture. I want to underline. We need to agree, to disagree, agree a bit. You know, I mentioned this to one of my workers at, at work. He said, Where did you learn this? I said, From my brother in law. <laughs> Well, we, all, we, we all learn from each other. This is an interesting question, by the way. Am I bound to be punished before I actually commit a sin if the thought of committing uh, that action existed in my mind, but I did not act upon it? Yeah, thoughts that are not acted upon, Allah will expose them, but punishment, most probably not. No. Ya'mal mithqal daratin yara. You will see, you will see. Oh, wait, I'm not done yet. I've got another 30 minutes. <laughs>
Yara. Quran says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَشَرًا يَرَى You will see. Judged? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so only the, the ideas and the thoughts that settle in the mind. Which you given, act upon. Yeah, but. given the opportunity. Allah knows if you have the opportunity to act upon those thoughts, right. what kind of action you will come up with, and he will hold you accountable accordingly. And if we, if we harbor negative thoughts, our demeanor will become negative. We are the product of our thoughts. Please understand, and I mentioned in my lecture, our thoughts of yesterday is who we are today. Please don't forget that. Our thoughts of yesterday is why we are who we are today. And our thoughts for tomorrow should be dictated today. So let's decide what we want to be tomorrow and start thinking that way and start thinking positive and start seeing the grace. Imagine yourself being the neighbor of the Prophet. Imagine yourself that the Imam is pleased with you and me and saying, I like you, you are my agent and I love what you do and I love your demeanor. That's the kind of imagination we should always have and have hope. And never, none of us should say we're damaged goods. Oh, I'm going to hell, you know, if I can only get the breath of paradise. Don't say that. Say, inshallah, paradise has been decreed for me, but I am going to struggle for the highest stations of paradise. That's what I want. Okay, uh, the next two questions is about hijab. I'm talking about uh, sisters' hijab, not the hijab of the men. Oh. Why do Muslim girls perceive hijab as a choice rather than mandatory? Why is the hijab ignored as if it was not important? And the next question is, I try to encourage my daughter to wear hijab, but she is resisting the idea because of school, etc. Our belief systems in the way we dress and the way we behave is primarily predicated by societal rules. If the community at large demonizes or vilifies or looks down or marginalizes the commandment of Allah, then it'll become common talk to say it's no good. There's no need for this. As I mentioned in my speech, when people do things, everybody's doing it, so it almost becomes mustahab to do it. We have this habit that sometimes we demonize these dresses, and sometimes it's been abused, of course. You know, and, and the Western society loves to demonize the hijab as a symbol of oppression, as a symbol of second-class citizenship. Even Christiane Amanpour, when she went to the Islamic Republic and she was talking to one of the members of Majlis, and she says, well, isn't this oppression? Whenever I'm asked that question in media, I look at the question, I said, how, by what logic did you apply oppression with a headscarf. So you're saying when a woman is, it's cold outside, it's raining, and she puts her headscarf on, she's oppressed? Like, where, how did you associate oppression with dressing? Where did you get this from? This is a poison pill. I said, can you please validate so that I can now answer your question? And they said, well, well um, 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 um. I said, thank you. <laughs> because it's a poison pill. It's oppression. What oppression? When you cover yourself, you're oppressed? So I look at them and say, excuse me, so when you don't cover yourself, you're free? It's, when you're not covered, it's an oppression. <laughs> I mean, think about it. When your clothes are taken away, it's an oppression. Cover yourself. Libas of taqwa, Allah says, that we've given you two kinds of dresses, the one with modesty and the one with piety. When a human being dresses up, it's beautiful. So this idea that when you dress up and you cover yourself, you're oppressed. When somebody asks you, isn't this oppression? Ask them, can you explain to me what logic and rationality did you use to conclude that a headscarf or a loose garb equals oppression? Is there scientific knowledge? Is there something scientific that you've observed that there's a direct correlation to covering your head with oppression? It's absurd. If you really think about it, just... just Try, come, come up with an answer, tell me. Now if you say, well, why, why, are, men, why are men, you know, not wearing it? Why are men not wearing it? Women have to wear Isn't that oppression? Quran states, hijab is for men and women. Say to believing men to lower their eyes. Men should be dressed decently too. Allah never said men should go out indecently. Decency is for men too. For God's sake, it's not a, hijab is not a woman thing. It's a human thing. Our tongue is a hijab. The way I talk is my hijab. The way I look at you is my hijab. When do I not have hijab that sisters have it? We all have hijab. The difference is there's a slight differentiation. This, Allah says, 
You know, يَا يَهُنْ نَبِي قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِ بِهِنَّ Let them wear this dress. Oh, Prophet, your wives, the women, the believing women, your children, your daughters, let them wear it. ذَلِكَ أَدْنَى أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَا It's better for them, so they're honored. Why? Because they are the mothers of our children, for God's sakes. The generations come from our women. Today, if you look at sexual harassment in the Western world, where women are used and abused in such horrible ways, you know, and these misogynistic leaders that we have today shrug their shoulders like, yes, they're collateral damage. Look at this Jeffrey Epstein, a monster. The kind of evils this man performed under the, leaders, under the guise of this super powerful elite group and got away with so much like Harvey Weinstein. And you, the list goes on and on and every single day more of these criminals are showing up and our women are subjected to all kinds of sexual harassment, tyranny. It's not a secret that this has happened when we are all trying to fight for freedom with the freedom of expression in an, in an illicit way. It's an interesting thing that dating is a common thing in the West, but when you're married, a non-Muslim couple, and if the husband comes out of the room with his secretary, she's very beautiful, and the wife looks, she says, hmm. I say, what's the big deal? I'm suspicious. Says, Why? We grew up this way anyway. Notice the fitra, even those who don't believe in Islam know that this is, there's a problem here. Where you put your hand, there's a problem. Where you say, there's a problem. Today, sexual harassment is so rigid. You look at a woman the wrong way, she can accuse you. Good. It's about time we became more cognizant of our obligations of hijab. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Here is, uh, I think this is going to be a challenge for you. You ready? Everything's a challenge. Regarding the Quranic narrative of al Qaeda and... Oh, Islamism. don't go there. Don't go there? I, I will discuss that. This is, this is a heavy-duty conversation. What's don't, another one? I would like to answer. Yeah, yeah, why don't you answer? Okay, don't no, no, please, please. Don't worry. You should, I now that you opened it up. I'm going to a lecture, sorry. <laughs> I might go into a lecture. It's okay, I'll stop you. Uh, here's another one. We are told that if you don't believe in Ahl al you will not see the gates of paradise. What happens to the good Christians and Jews? Will they enter paradise? Ahl al-Bayt are the ultimate template for humanity. Whether you know them or you don't. When you break down the components of Ahl al-Bayt, there's a large componentry list. Any human being who resonates in this direction is within the pathway of Ahlul Bayt, even if they don't know. Some of us are privileged to know Ahlul Bayt. Not everybody has that privilege. On Judgment Day, Allah will judge those people by their resonance of Ahlul Bayt. It's too short, right? You turned, he turned the mic off. He was going to go sit down. Regarding the daily prayers, how do I attain full concentration and connection? Because when I pray, I never feel that connection, and that is why sometimes I end up neglecting my prayers. Okay. It's important that we should feel high in prayers once in a while, the spiritual high, the halal high. Um, <laughs> because I know in the world today when you speak, it's like, brother Satan, he's got to be high when you pray. Um, spiritual high. The Prophet said humans have biorhythmic cycles. There are days when we're spiritual in a high level, and there are days when we feel very flat. That fluctuation actually is very healthy because what it does is when, when your modulation is, when, when you're at the bottom of the trough, you feel very flat, you don't feel very spiritual. If you understand the biorhythmic movement of yourself, man arafa nafsa, if you know that, what will happen is you will become very disturbed by it. Like today I prayed, it was just so flat, something's wrong. Now you are seeking. It was, it was, it's like you ate food, but it didn't satisfy you. It wasn't tasty, and it's bothering you. And now you're looking for that best moment that you had a, a few days ago. You want it again. Well, that's healthy. That fluctuation and modulation is healthy. It's a long conversation, but I'll just share briefly some of the components. One is when you and I are in a constant state of reflection, meditation, and gratitude, salah becomes very easy. Many a times when we pray, I'm going to say something profound, 
When we pray, many a times, prayer is a distraction for us. We're busy with the worldly pursuits. Adhan is recited. I'm distracted. I have to let go of my worldly matters and go and speak to Allah. This is most of us. Oh, Salah time, I got to go. We're distracted. Salah is a distraction. What happens is, if I'm talking to Haj Ali right now, for example, I'm very busy with him, and somebody shows up, says, Haj Hassanin, can I ask a question? Out of courtesy, I look at the person. I said, yes, but my mind is here. And then he's talking to me, and I'm talking to him, but my mind is here. This third person is a distraction. So I'm not giving full attention. See, I'm, dis I'm distracted. My attention is here. My thought is here. This is you and I with dunya. You and I are very engrossed in the world and prayer is a distraction and we have to give it its due moment because out of courtesy and we know that it's a command of God. So what we're doing now is it's a distraction. If you and I can work to flip it where the world is a distraction and salah is what you're longing, it's a whole different experience. When you and I are constantly in meditation and reflection, and you are eager to go and speak to the, bene the, 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 the one who is giving you uh, the beneficence, the God, the, the Lord that you believe in, and you love this creator, and everything you look around every single day, the phone calls, the people, you are in gratitude, what happens is you keep looking at your time. Is it Salah time? Is it Salah time? Why? Because this world is distracting, and I want to focus. That's the difference in how you and I can change the dynamics. You might say, how? Change the value of the world. When you and I are dealing with the world, see how important is this that I'm doing. The money that I'm acquiring, the children that I have, the family, they're all very important. But how important relative to God? You will see that when you evaluate things, you will give it its proper measure. Many of us misevaluate and we give too much importance to something that's not important. We hold on to material trinkets and we consider it so important for us when we give up the real values. As a result, we end up taking this piece of glass that we found on the street that was glittering and we sold it for a few dollars to buy a piece of bread when in fact it's worth millions of dollars because we didn't know the value of this diamond. So when you and I know the value, well, how would we know the value? Reflect, meditate, examine, do your analysis and go down to the bottom line and say, what's left over in my life? What is the most important? The Prophet said, he said, you have three friends in the world. Three. Al-Malu wal-Banun, Zinat al-Hayat al-Dunya, wal al-Salihat. There are three friends you have, the Prophet said. So the companion says, Ya Rasulullah, who are these three friends? The Prophet asked, him, asked them, since you have heard, tell me. They said, we don't know. So the Prophet said, I will tell you. Your first friend is your money. It can only buy you your grave and your shroud. Nothing else. That's it. Al-Malu wal-Banun, Mal. Banun is your second friend, your family and your friends. They will wash you, they will shroud you, they will bury you. They can do nothing after that. The third friend will come with you and stay with you forever and protect you and raise your standards. He said, but alas, the prophet said, alas, the human race is busy making friends with the first two and has ignored the third when it's the third that comes with you forever. وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتِ خَيْرٌ عِنَّ رَبِّكَ Which is most foremost to God is the third one, but we have forgotten. So if we don't value it, then salah, fasting, everything becomes a hindrance. It becomes a chore and a duty. And then finally, Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi alayhi really nailed this one. Subhanallah. He, he made my head spin when this one. He was seen praying, you know, relatively quickly. He said, you know, Sayyid, you are a marja, you're praying rather quickly. He replied the following. He said, prayer begins when it ends. Wow. First, I didn't know what he meant. So what? Prayer begins when, how does it begin when it ends? Like, isn't that a contradiction? Prayer begins when it ends. Then it dawned on me, so, oh my God, he's nailed it. See, what we just did for the 10 minutes was reaffirming what we're going to do. When Salah finished, now Allah says, now go act on the Salah. Many of us, when we roll up the carpet, we've done the duty for God, let me go back to my old ways. That is not Salah. That's why it's a distraction. But if you do what you said in Salah, 
with the real meaning that you're surrendering to God and you do believe that God is the one who gives you and you do choose the best chosen people that God so prophets in Ahlul Bayt in the Quran and the good people are my an'amta alayhim then I'm not listening to anyone else not tyrants, not bad, not wicked, not ignorant people. Now live it. Every day you make choices, you're going to say, only these people I will follow. God gives me. The guy says, well, I want you to sell your soul to me and give me A, B, and C. We can do this real haram act and we'll become millionaires. You look, he said, no, sorry. But it's a great opportunity. No one will catch us. We'll never go to jail. We'll become millionaires. He said, no. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'een. I only get it from Allah. And my way is only Allah. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Why? Because I just said it five times a day. That's what I want to do. So salah begins when it ends. Thank you. Very good. The prayers begins when it ends. In the same manner, our hajj begins when we come back from hajj. Right? Yes, okay. absolutely. In fact, Imam Jafar Sadiq is talking to his companion and said, how do you know that hajj was accepted? He said, have you maintained honesty, integrity, dignity? Do you, have you reached the level where you can put your hand in your brother's pocket and take what is yours? He says, if you haven't got to that level, then you haven't understood Hajj. Hajj is a genius, genius prescription of God, genius. God, we can talk about it till Judgment Day, just that event, re, re, reenacting Ibrahim's trial with Ismail, with Hajra. Hajra and Ismail are included in the Tawaf. The Kaaba being covered in the black cloth, Hajra taking a hijab, covering it, Ibrahim praying, Rabbi Jalni Muqima Salati wa min Dhuriyati, in Awala Baitin Mudi. Oh my god, it's the whole Islam. When you're going around the Kaaba, say, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika, Laka Labbaik. God says, I'm the center of your universe. You're going to go around me seven times each time, and you're going to bear witness that I'm the center of your universe. It's so powerful. While you are seeing people of all colors and sizes from all around the world, millions. And this is just a small speck. There are two billion Muslims, 2,000 million Muslims. At the Kaaba, there's probably two million people at one time. Probably three million people. Nothing. Not even one-tenth of one percent. If you look at the, at the numbers, subhanAllah, you find even that number is sufficient to tell you the power of humanity. Next question, how do I argue with a Christian that the belief in Trinity is absurd? They always reply that it is a matter of faith and not based on logic. Right. Well, faith is important, but faith not built on sound logic is like jumping on quicksand. Faith is very important. But I'll give you the analogy of faith. I'll give you the analogy of faith. Follow it. Faith is very important. When I was debating Dan Barker, and he said to me, Hassanain, I've, I've written a book called Losing Faith in Faith. So I said, Dan, you don't believe in faith? He said, no, faith is false. I said, Dan, you have killed humanity. He said, what do you mean? I said, faith is extremely important. It's the power to prognosticate and predict your future based on the present and the past. Otherwise, you're not a human being. Like when you and I agreed to debate three months ago, you had faith that we would have this debate. Otherwise, you wouldn't have agreed on it. So you cannot say, I've lost faith. Faith is the power to jump for the future at the present. I am going to sign an agreement with you to go into business. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So then you can say that when you did, you must have had faith. Otherwise, it's impossible. When you work in the office and you have a worker who's really, really good, and this worker is excellent, very predictable. Now one day you give him the keys and says, now I want you to open my business. You say, why did you give him the keys? He says, I have faith in this person. How do you have faith? Well, he has proven in the past to be very reliable. Therefore, now I'm going to take a leap of faith. And I know that the probability of this person showing up on time is high. Is that wrong? No. Faith is very important. But blind faith is dangerous where there's no meaning. So I was in Dubai, and there was a Christian man who says, I want to debate you. I said, okay. So he said to me that, 
Um, I said, so we, I started asking him about the Trinity. He says, no, no, there's no logic in Trinity. Trinity is a faith thing. You have to believe in it. I said, oh, I see. So you have no logic in it? He said, no. I said, okay, no problem. So then I'm looking at him, he says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Why did your prophet marry nine wives? I said, I'd love to answer you that question, but since you've abandoned logic, I don't know how to start. In fact, I'm using language that's very logical. I'm in violation of your beliefs because you are totally illogical. Your faith is so blind that I cannot use logic even by asking you a question. So how did you have the strength to ask me a logical question? So why is it when you approach me, you're logical, but when I approach you, you abandon logic? Does that make sense? Or you're cherry picking? <laughs> I said, it's amazing. You're wondering why he married more than one? Is it logical to you? He said, yes. I said, why are you processing it? If you're going to base your entire faith on no logic, then you should never ask anybody any question. If a Hindu believes in a God or gods or thousands of gods or doesn't believe in a God, why don't you just give them all the benefit of the faith of blindness and let them all follow their blind faith? Because there's no rationality once again. This doesn't make sense. Let's go to the Bible. You find Isa never, ever claims to be the son of God. He said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but that which sent me. I of my own free will can do nothing but that which sent me. Isa salam prayed when Lazarus died. And people said, Lazarus is dead. Isa is making sujood and praying. Imam Jafar Sadiq asks the Christian, does God pray? He prays to who? God prays? Can you imagine Allah praying? So the answer is very simple. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus salam, ever say. In fact, his pronouncement is very clear. Hear ye Israel, your Lord is one. Okay? And Isa salam, clearly talks about it. And he keeps saying that there is only one God and we submit to him. So if you're going to go by the prescriptions of the Bible, you will see that the words of Jesus salam, is unanimously that he is the servant of God. In fact, interestingly, when he was supposedly crucified, he says in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Here, Eloi means, in Aramaic means, my God. So I asked my Christian brethren, why is Jesus, who is God, calling him my God? Isn't he God? Well, he became man for a moment, then he became... I said, I can't... No matter how you do it, you flip. If you take him to God, he becomes man. If you take him to man, he becomes God. I said, you know, this whimsical question, you know and I know that it doesn't make sense. So the Trinitarian idea is something, unfortunately, our Christian brethren are good and they have a good heart, and they really want to love God. But the idea of anthropomorphizing and deifying a human being in flesh and form is just simply not true. And the Quran eradicates this very clearly. And you know, by the way, interestingly, in the Bible, Jesus, when he's born, without a father, which we believe, the Bible doesn't mention the miracle of Jesus speaking in the cradle. But the Quran says it. Now, if you look at the correction, the Quran states that the reason Isa salam, spoke when he was born, he had to, because the accusation of Maryam that a man touched her would be impossible to prove unless the baby speaks. That's why when she was complaining, as soon as she gave birth to Isa salam, she was complaining, the pain was excruciating. And Allah says, Fanada min tahtiha, an la tahzani, qad ja'ala rabbuki tahtaki sariya. Look at this child is talking. He's telling his mother that uh, put your foot in the, in, the, in the river and cool yourself and shake this tree and take ripe dates from it. Do not. And then when she brings the baby, you know, they said, Ya Haruna, ma kana abu ma kanat she points to him. She says, How can we talk to a baby who is, in, who is a baby in the cradle? She says, He said, I am the servant of God. I've been given the book. I've been made a prophet. I bring good news wherever I am. 
Think about what Jesus is saying. I have been prescribed a prophet, and I uphold prayer, and I promote good, I forbid evil, right? I maintain, and I am, be, I am made kind to my mother. وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَتِي and I'm not insolent. Then he says, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ أُلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبْعَثُ حَيِّ ذَلِكَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ If you look at the Quranic description of Jesus alayhi salam, my God, it's a huge difference between this and the other. The other, the first miracle Jesus performs in the Bible is he turns water into wine in the Feast of Canaan. And before he turns water to wine, wine, wine. If you read the Bible, when John the Baptist is born, God said he shall be a great man in a great nation and he shall touch no wine. The Bible says it. Yet you find Jesus turns water into wine. First miracle. And before he does, he calls his mother woman. Woman. How do you talk to your mother and call her woman? Quran says, وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَتِي I've been made kind to my mother. You don't call your mother woman. I ask my Christian brethren, do you ever call your mother woman? So this thing is an interpolation, it's not true. So the Trinitarian idea is something later on. And in fact, if you look at history of Christianity, there were Unitarians and Trinitarians. Quick, Creed of Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea, which Constantine the Emperor passed in 325 AD, was the seal of the Trinitarian Church. Prior to that, the Trinitarians were, were there, but they were under the tutelage of Constantine, the emperor, who was a pagan. He was an idol worshiper. You know that he presided over these dialogues between the Unitarian, okay, Arius, who was a Unitarian, and Athanasius, who was a Trinitarian, and these two argued for months, and Constantine would sit there and preside over them. Then he looked at his population among his people. He noticed there were more Trinitarians than Unitarians, so he passed the Creed of Nicaea, basically sealing that said the Trinitarian Church is right, the Unitarian Church should be destroyed, and all the Bibles found by the Unitarians should be put to the fire and destroyed. And I think that was that death blow of the Trinitarian idea against the, uh, the Unitarians. But you find Arius, if you listen to his arguments, subhanAllah, he talks, he looks at uh, Athanasius. He said, God doesn't move. God is almighty, all powerful. He doesn't take shape and form. He's not born, nor does he die. This man was a very, had a very high position in Christianity. So when you go back in history, you will see that it is not what it is today. And with all due respect, you will see that what Paul did by removing the practice in religion, you find with all due respect, you go to Rome, which was the seat of the Roman Empire, near the Vatican, most churches today are being occupied by Muslims doing their salah. Over 300 churches just in one region in Europe moved over to become prayers, uh, places of worship. Even, even the Christians are angry as to why they're giving it to the Muslims. They said, well, who else is going to pray? But we should invite the Christians. They're good people. They have love for God. When I sit with them and I say, look, Jesus said this. He didn't say this. And you are my brother and you are on the same platform as I am, and I don't condemn you to hell. I have no authority to condemn you to hell. Your love for God may be even greater than mine, but this is the truth. See? Qawl al-haq, speak the truth. Okay, uh, unfortunately we are running out of time, so we'll yeah. take the last question. We'll try to make it quick, inshallah. Uh, some of us cannot afford to send our children schools. So can you give us some practical tips for to ensure protection of our children who are raised in the West, especially if they're surrounded by indecency and yes. Look, I, I give you an example. It's a very good question, by the way. There are people who cannot afford to send their children to an Islamic school. We run an Islamic school in Michigan. By Allah's grace, Allah has enabled us to do something very difficult and inshallah it will continue to grow in many fronts because to me I think eradication of poverty is through education. When parents come to me and say education is expensive, I say to them if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. It's the most expensive thing. So we must eradicate ignorance by educating our children at any cost. And I say to our parents, if your child gets accepted to the best school in the world 
and you can't really afford it, would you let it pass? They said, no, we will borrow money, we will do whatever, and we will educate. I said, put that in the mind and understand the gravity of education. But there are, being realistic, there are families who can't afford it. The answer to that is, become an environment conducive to Allah. At home, read Quran, keep a healthy environment in the house. And as I mentioned about the fluctuations of biorhythms, you know, you know if, you, if you look at a scale, you know, you got amplitude and you got frequency. Okay, frequency and amplitude. Our biorhythms, the greater the amplitude, the more confused we are. If top is iman and low is low iman, the, the wider the amplitude, the more confused we are. So you want to bring it flat, you want to bring it close, and then you want to raise it up towards Allah, not towards Iblis. And you want to reduce the, the, uh, the frequencies. Okay? You want to flatten it out. How do you do that? What you do is, when you go down on your scale, the bottom part, the days you don't feel good, you're not spiritual, what you do is you associate with people who are spiritual. What will happen is if you combine their waves, most likely when your wave is down, theirs is up. And that's your safety net. That the minute you feel down, the brother and the sister you're close to who is conscious of Allah will have high spirits and what they will do is they'll prevent you from bottoming out into the bottom of the trough. And what will happen is people who are God conscious will raise your bar and before you know it, you'll become a better and a better person because the combinations of all the, let's say there's six good people together with you, all God conscious, their waves are going to cancel out the negatives and it's going to force the whole movement higher. So let's raise our children in good environments. Teach them to choose good friends. Make sure that Allah is talked about. Gossiping should be stopped. Lying should be stopped. Halal rizq should be acquired. Maintain a healthy Islamic environment, you will see our children will be raised very well. Look, I don't claim to be anything good, but I grew up in public schools. I didn't go. I went to a Catholic school when I was a child, but I grew up in public schools. But by my parents had a very strong foundation in the house, and I understood it. And it helped me, and I went to Islamic school on the weekends. You know, when I was a child, I used to go to Islamic school in Africa. And that affected me. The things that I learned, and then my mother and my father and my grandfather constantly infusing Quran into me. When I was in the university and I'm debating, my friends were saying, how come you're not losing these debates? I said, I don't know. It seems like I'm just, it's so clear. I mean, I see it. It's, it's, your argument just doesn't make sense. And then I realized, wow, Allah has blessed me with the best religion. And the more I looked into it, the more I uncovered it, the more I realized, oh my God, I have a treasure in my life. And how foolish I am to have taken it lightly. But it takes struggle. It takes a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of growth, a lot of reading, a lot of questioning. But with patience, we'll uncover it, and Allah will take us closer. I know I'm on a journey. I have a long way to get closer to Allah. But I feel so energetic and so blessed that if, you gave, if Allah gave me a thousand years more on this earth, I would never get tired waking up in the morning knowing that God has given me one more day to serve Him. I think that's the greatest joy of living knowing that God has chosen us and given us an opportunity to do something that others generally don't do, it's the greatest feeling. All of us are blessed with that. Every one of us in this room has that blessing, especially you, my young brothers here, sisters, feel energized, say, I want to do something and I'm going to achieve it. And if you truly believe in it, you will get it. Promise. Okay? Shall we end? Yes, to end this, I just want to quickly read a comment made by a sister in the audience. Salam Hajj Hussain, this is not a question, I just wanted to thank you and bless you for the lectures. They were really amazing. Inshallah, we continue to have you here for our new Amen, Inshallah. Alaikum Salam. Amen, Inshallah, it's my honor. The honor is mine. Believe me, your patience here, look at the way you're sitting, patiently listening, giving this honor to this gathering. Uh, trust me, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the Prophet, it's the Quran, it's the Ahlul Bayt. We are its beneficiaries. When I come up here, I am honored because of them. And if my name is never mentioned, and no one ever knows me, I am just as happy because we're not important. What is important is Allah, the Prophet, is Ahlul Bayt, the Quran, and their ways. That's important. Let's focus on those 
We are all conduits. At the end of the day, our names will vanish. I always say, my great-grandchildren won't even know my first name. Why am I trying to carve out my name? It doesn't make, a, doesn't make any sense. But the tongue and the lips and the body and the mind and the hair and the blood, everything is given to us as a gift of God. Let's give it back. Let's give it with passion. And you know, we are its beneficiaries. When we do it, nobody gets more benefit than us. When I come and speak in these lectures, people say, MashaAllah, thank you, thank you. I said, no, thank you. Thank you for loving Ahlul Bayt. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for appreciating. It's a combination of two together. So I thank you all sincerely, and I pray that we all rise to the occasion not to be the ones who abandon Imam Hussein when he called, just like when Imam Mahdi reappears. We should not abandon him. We should be preparing. One quick story that really comes to my mind is as a brother who is a physician who goes to Iraq every year, and he's an emergency medicine specialist. And, he, and I mentioned this about him a few times. It touched me a lot because he's a very good friend of mine. It's from childhood I've known him. And he got married recently, and now, mashallah, he's settled down. But every year, twice a year, he goes to Iraq. And he goes to Najaf, and he goes to Karbala, and he's establishing emergency medicine. I said, why? He said, I went there for Ziyara. I noticed that at 3 o'clock in the morning, if somebody gets hurt, there is no emergency medicine protocols. I'm a graduate of a very prestigious school in America, and I think it's my duty to do this. I said, why are you doing this? He said, I'm preparing for the living Imam. When he reappears, we have emergency service. I said, SubhanAllah, wow, you're thinking that? He said, yeah, I'm going every year, twice a year, to establish emergency medicine, teaching the local Iraqi physicians how to follow protocols so that we save more lives. Because I know when the Imam reappears, this will be needed. Now, to me, I patted him on his back, said, bravo. I hugged him. I said, wow, you have put a smile in my face. For there are very few people like you planning for the return of our blessed Imam. The Prophet said, afdalul ibadah in tadar al-Mahdi, the best form of Ibadah is the intadar of your living Imam to follow him and to believe in him because that's what gives us energy to do good. So inshallah all of us will do that and we make dua inshallah Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin karima tu'izzu biha al-islam wa ahla wa tudhillu biha al-nifaq wa ahla wa taj'aluna fiha min al-du'ati la ta'atik wa al-qadati la sabili wa tarzuquna biha karamat al-dunya wa al-akhra wa akhir al-da'un alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. I want to thank my respected Sheikh Jafar uh, may Allah bless you for joining us. The organizers, Haj Hassan, uh, and the whole team. As you know, if not for these wonderful personalities who have made this possible, and the sisters, I see you sweeping at night, picking up the tables and the chairs and the volunteers who are standing up there in the cold weather, you know, directing traffic. You are that foundation that Allah, inshallah, will bless that these gatherings were able to happen and you carefully modulated to make sure even the sound, the brothers with the sound system and so on, may Allah reward every one of you and may Allah give tawfiq to this community and to this center and to this organization to continue to grow, to flourish so that when the Imam reappears, we will be ready for him, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. us to also pray for Sayyid Hashim. I met him today, mashallah. He is in good spirits. I pray for his long life, for he is the spirit of this community. And may Allah give him long, long life and health and return and serve many more years ahead. Oh, you're going to, please. Uh, we're going to do a ziyadah, please. It's too much.